Okay, so if we think about, uh, uh, this is not super important, but um, it's something that I thought of. Cosine, if I, remember we, I talked about yesterday how the dot product is comparing what's similar between two vectors, right? And uh, the cross product is comparing what's different. So that's one way that you could think about it. And so as the two um, vectors, if you picture the two vectors spinning apart from each other, the difference between them is getting bigger, right? And sine is getting bigger to a point. And then it starts to get smaller again. So it like kind of match, it kind of makes sense that the cross product is using sine. Well, of course it makes sense, but if you think about it that way, the cross product is using sine, has sine in it, and the dot product has cosine in it, because it, the dot product, as they get closer together, or as they get farther together, I, I, farther apart, I should say, cosine goes to zero and then goes negative and, and so on and so forth. But so that kind of makes sense when you think about it that way. Anyway, but this is an important part. N is a unit vector because the problem with this, magnitude of A times magnitude of B times sine theta. So again, for dot product, it's magnitude of A times magnitude of B times cos theta. And that gives us a scalar. The dot product result is a scalar. But the cross product is supposed to be a vector. So what we do is this gives us the magnitude. This part right here gives us the magnitude. And then we add in um, n is a unit vector in the direction of a cross b. So orthogonal to both a and b. Uh, which is kind of a little trick because it's like, well, except that we don't know what direction that's supposed to be. So we don't know what n is. We'd have to have a different way of figuring it out. Um, but that's the definition that we go with. Any questions about that? Luckily, there is, this may not be on your, because I added this after, it's called the right hand rule. Oh, I don't even have it written down. You don't have to write this down, don't worry. You don't have this on your sheet, do you? The right-hand rule. So this is how you could figure out what direction and the, the cross product vector is going or what direction that vector n, the unit vector, uh, in the proper direction is going with the right-hand rule. This is, anytime you look up the cross product or talk about the cross product or anything, you're going to see people talking about the right-hand rule, so it's good to point it out. It's not actually something that we're going to use, though, because when we calculate it, uh, typically, we want the calculation part. We, we either get the Cartesian vector, which has a direction built into it, or if we use this other version, we probably only want the magnitude anyway. But what it says is when I do A cross B, I have to use my right hand. Now, again, this is actually sort of tricky because you can, you can do this kind of math in a left-handed system. But typically, in Canada, we use a right-handed system, so it's the right-hand rule. And you literally do this with your right hand, where A cross B, the order counts, and A is your index finger, B is your middle finger. Those are the two vectors. And the, your thumb points in the direction that the cross product, the outcome of the cross product would point. If you think about the two vectors, what are you looking for? You got it yesterday. I didn't get it. Take this one. Um, if you think about the cross product, okay, oh, I wanted to actually do this. Let's say these are my two vectors. So. If I, if I put them like this, okay, I can move this around in three space however I want. It still only, it has two vectors that are orthogonal to both. So if I take my third vector, like I could have, like this is perpendicular to the bottom ruler, right? And I can rotate it around like that as much as I want. But it's not perpendicular to the other ruler. 
So where would it be if I stick it out like that? It's going to be perpendicular. That's going to be orthogonal or perpendicular. Orthogonal to both. Or like that. Those are the only two options. Anywhere else, it's going to be at perpendicular to maybe one, but not the other. So it's the only option. Okay. So basically, when we've done the cross product, if we have the magnitude, we know it's either this or this. And the right hand rule would just tell you which. But if you but unless you have everything oriented somehow, why is that useful anyway? Like if you're just looking at numbers on a page, okay, so it goes so it goes this direction. What does that even mean? But it turns out there are applications like torque where um, you would use the cross product and then you would know the direction of the of the resulting force, torque force. So this certainly does have application and people do use it. Engineers would use it doing certain things. It, like the right hand rule is absolutely a thing. This is not, turns out it's not really a thing that we're going to see. Um, and, that, and I can, and it's, uh, to me, this is part of vectors is visualizing this stuff. So it's, it's important to think through it. But like I, if I change these, I still am only ever going to get, no matter what I do, I'm still only ever going to get, it's going to be kind of hard for me to do, but like one vector here or one vector here pointing up or pointing down. Sometimes we talk about it out of the paper or into the paper. So if I think about my two vectors lying on the plane of the paper, is it coming out this way or going in that way, right? And, and that's what you would do is you would, you would either hold your hand like this to get the A and the B correct, or flip it to get the A this way and the B the other direction. The last thing I'll say on this is the video series that I posted, I posted four videos. In that video series, it has a very different visualization of this where it talks about the parallelogram. I kind of like it better, but it's too much for us to get into. But if you want to watch it, it's only like a 10 minute video on the cross product. Um, and if, you, if you're ever watching those videos and some of the background goes over your head, that's probably fine. So it starts to talk about the determinant, and I talk about this, and there's a video on that, but you don't have to watch that. You could just kind of like, oh, okay, that part I don't understand. Skip it and watch some of the other visualizations. And it talks about the cross product of A, B being, is it like, is A here and B is above it? Or is A here and B is below it? And that's kind of what defines the, the right-hand rule or similarities. Anyway. Moving on. So it's just so you've heard of it and you're not like, oh, Mr. Belair never told us about the right-hand rule. It, it very likely won't be useful to us, uh, but it's kind of a big thing. Okay, so let's do a couple of these. So in this case, again, hopefully we're starting to get familiar with this. Uh, we can be given vectors in Cartesian form, Cartesian vectors, and then we would use one version of the cross product or dot product, or we can be given vectors, uh, I suppose, given their magnitudes and possibly their direction. In this case, we're given their relative direction. That's all. Okay. So there's nothing more to this. Then we use a formula. Don't forget vector n. Like if you left that off on a quiz or a test or something, you, you're going to lose half a mark because it is an important part of the definition. And it does, like, I know it seems trivial because I just finished saying it's not really going to be all that relevant, but. It's the difference between the dot product that results in a scalar and the cross product that results in a vector. And that's like huge, huge, right? So. And this works out to about 3,600, you can check my math here, 636, 46.4 times so now I see I have a scalar times a vector. That's a unit vector. So when I multiply by the scalar, it's just going to get the size of the scalar. 
So that's exactly the vector that we want. Again, I don't know the direction of n. All I, theta is just the relative angle between the two vectors. I don't know, is this, like, can you visualize this? Because we, we spend so much time talking about x and y. As we think of x and y are in, are automatically in a plane together. But I can take that, but if I'm in three space, literally like this classroom, I can, I can spin these around. So if they're at about a 50 degree angle, I can spin them around like this. And that's going to change the direction of n. So they might be at 50 degrees to each other like this, flat, or it could be skewed like this, or like this, or like this, or anything, and that's going to change the direction of n. So we don't know that. We just know n is going to be orthogonal to both a and b, and it's a unit vector. That's all we know. But that's all we need to know for now, so that's okay. This one works out to about 3059.7. So if you think about it, both of them have magnitude times magnitude. Those are the same magnitudes. And sine and cosine are the same at 45. So they would have sort of equal magnitudes at 45. And if you think about everything else we've talked about, cross product and dot product, like that kind of makes sense. And 50 is close, so those answers are close, but they, they certainly wouldn't always be close. Sometimes they would be very different. We Everybody good with this? Pretty straightforward. Don't get that mixed up. Don't get them backwards, sine and cosine. Uh, we've talked about this already, but here you go, parallelogram property. And we I'm going to just do a quick little sketch here, but we, we talked about it the other day. The magnitude of A cross B, or written like that magnitude A cross B, is the area of the parallelogram defined by A and B when they're arranged tail to tail. So if I call this A, doesn't really matter, but, and I call this B, I would extend these over and think about the, the parallelogram area that's being mapped out. And, uh, and as I change B or A, that's going to change that parallelogram. So the area is equal to the magnitude of the cross product of those two vectors. has to be magnitude because a cross product gives us a vector so it's not just equal to the vector something with the quiz coming up yesterday and working with some students from the other classes at lunch and just having different discussions even just talking to Mr. Gardner and stuff about this it's interesting when you think about you know people don't people don't get some of the finer nuances and they would write something like this vector a times vector b like write them side by side what, what, what in the world does that even mean? You multiply two vectors, right? What does that mean? When you think about it, now that we've done some of this, what does it mean to multiply two vectors? It doesn't make any sense. You can multiply their magnitudes. You can take their dot product. That has a definition. You can take their cross product. That has a definition. But it doesn't mean to just, well, I just want to multiply them. <laughs> That's not a thing, right? That's not defined. That's not a, a thing. So be careful, again, it would be important that we talk about the magnitude. Otherwise, you're saying it's a vector, which an area isn't a vector. OK, moving on to some more different kinds of examples. Oh, yeah, here we go. Find the area of the parallelogram. They form one tail to tail. See, what if we put this question on test without ever having shown you how to do it? You've got all the skills. You've done this exact kind of thing before, but you would have to kind of walk through this up. Wait a minute. What is this actually asking me to do? Like, how do I do this? Well, we want the magnitude of A cross B. What is A cross B? 
a vector. If you want a magnitude of a vector, you probably want to know what the vector is. How would we find the vector? By completing the dot cross product, sorry, not dot product, cross product. So the first thing you want to do here is go ahead and find a cross B. Like this is a simple question, but if you're not familiar with the small steps that it's asking you to do, I could see somebody drawing a blank on this on a test and being like, wait a minute, I don't need, what am I actually, what's it actually asking me to do? If it told you the steps, you'd be able to do it, but what's it actually asking you to do? So, do you remember how to do the cross product? Remember our little trick off to the side, those of you who weren't here yesterday? What we do, uh, it, you'll have to look back at the lesson, we're not going to reteach it from scratch, but what we do is we use this little um, organizer off to the side, okay? And because of the way the cross product works, we start with the y values in the vectors. So I'm going to write 3, 2, 6, 3. So you see what I did there? I wrote 3, 2, 6, and then 3 again, and then I stop. Make sense? And then I'm going to do the same below. There are other ways of doing this. This is the way that I like to do it. Okay, and then you just use this organizer, uh, and what I do is I start with, it's A cross B, so I've got A on top and B on bottom, by the way, that's important. So I do 3 times 9 minus 2 times 3, or 3 times 2. Okay, so I do this times this, or sorry, this times this minus this times this. Okay, so that's 27 minus 6. That's my x value. And notice that these are the y's, these are the z's, these are the x's, and these are the y's again. So to find x, I used y and z. I didn't use x. And again, that's like an important sort of fundamental part of the cross product. Okay, next one is 2 times negative 5, so that's negative 10, minus 9 times 6, which is 54. Um, doing this without the organizer, some people will try. It's harder than you think. If you're going to try it without the organizer, after you check your answers while you're doing the homework, or do it with the organizer to check your answer and see if you're actually getting it right. Because my guess is some people can do it and some people can't. And it, to me, it's like it's hard to recognize when you're making a mistake. But when you write it like this, it's hard to make a mistake. It's easy to do, right? So 6 times 3, so that's going to be 18, minus 15, negative 15, so plus 15. 21, negative 64, and 33. Okay. And so now if I want to find the area of the parallelogram, what am I going to do? Very nice. So the magnitude of A cross B is equal to the square root of 21 squared plus negative 64 squared plus 33 squared. And that works out to about the square root of 5,626, I think. Is that right? Thank you. Therefore, the area, blah, 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 of the parallelogram, such and such. Okay. When I, the uh, therefore statement I think would be appropriate here, or even if you just were a little bit lazy and said like, therefore area equals or A equals or something, because it asks us to find the area, and what I did was say this equals that. That's not really, like it's implying, as long as everybody knows that that gives us the area, that's fine, but you've not really said area equals anywhere, and so that's kind of the reason why we would sometimes summarize and make sure we actually answer the question find the area there. the area of the parallelogram is okay something along those lines um, and there's something else that I wanted to say oh we'll talk about that after never mind let's do this one find the area of the par parallelogram formed by a and b the magnitude of a the magnitude of b and theta 
So we're going to use the other formula. Which, don't forget, has a vector n in it. And I got 749.9 .9 times vector n. But for the area of the parallelogram, it's the cross product, or sorry, it's the magnitude of the cross product, which is the magnitude of this. Does anybody have anything to say about this? Exactly. But we want to but we but we don't want to just ignore the n and drop it. Like we gotta take this extra step, unfortunately, to do this. The magnitude of n is one. So if you were thinking about a scalar times a vector and you were looking for the magnitude of the vector, it would be you just multiply them, right? So 749.9 units squared, right? Whatever the unit is. Any questions? The collinear property, two vectors are collinear if and only if, that's not a typo, their cross product is the zero vector. It's got to be the zero vector because the result of a cross product is a vector, okay? But the zero vector. Um, so what that means is if A cross B is the zero vector, then A and B are collinear, and it means if A and B are collinear, then A cross B will be the zero vector, right? So that's what the if and only if means. It goes both directions. And don't forget, dot product, if the dot product is zero, scalar, then vectors are orthogonal or perpendicular. Um, so this is very useful. I, I can use one to test one property and the other to test the other property. So this is a pretty big idea. So here's a simple example. If I'm given a vector and then I pick any scalar, so I picked four, but it would, I hope we would see that it would work with any scalar. And when we do the math, we'll kind of see why it works out that way, I think. Um, shouldn't the cross product be zero? I mean, a vector and a scaled multiple of that vector will be collinear, right? So then their cross product should be zero. So first of all, let's find K times A. So that's four times negative three, four times one, and four times four. So remember, I do the cross multiplying and then I subtract. So this is 1 times 16 minus 4 times 4. 4 times negative 12 minus 6 times negative 3, so that's plus. And negative 3 times 4 minus negative 12 times 1, so again, that's plus.
which equals, what does it equal? Don't say zero. The zero vector, which is what we were trying to show. Any questions? How different is this from the calculus we were doing just a few weeks ago? <laughs> Pretty different. What, what, what calculus and vectors? Like what makes those two things go to why? Because when you, when you go to university, calculus is calculus. That's one course. And linear algebra, which is like vectors, is a different course. You can do calculus with vectors, absolutely. They do cross over, but they both do numbers. They both, good points. They both do have numbers. Um, I guess it's just because where else would they think whoever designed the curriculum thinks it's all important and you got to jam it in somewhere. They didn't want to make a whole extra course. Anyway, it's kind of nice. Change of pace. Classify each of the following as a vector scalar or not possible. Hmm. Thoughts. I guess one tip I would say is use bed mass, right? Figure out what you would do first. Figure out what the result of that would be. And go from there. K times vector A would give me what? A vector. So this is going to be a vector cross a vector dot a vector. Vector cross vector will result in vector. So this is going to be vector dot vector. Can I do that? Dot product results in a? Scalar. Next one. A cross B vector dot vector cross vector. Vector dot vector results in scalar. So what's wrong here? Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, therefore not possible. There were questions like this in the uh, homework before I know, but, and then the last one, I'm gonna let you give it a try for a minute. See if you can think through it. What do you think about this one? Any, any thoughts or ideas? No wrong answers here, right? We're exploring. The whole point is that you just kind of try things. You might have questions. You might be wondering something. That's math. That's the point. So to share those things. You've got something to say. A few people look like they're about to So what happens on top? Vector minus a vector gives you what? So this k is a scalar times a vector. So a scalar times a vector gives you a vector. 
v divided by v. Oh, that's one. No, that's not one. <laughs> Those aren't the same vector. First of all, don't be don't, careful of my notation. This is like sloppy notation, right? But what do you think about this? John? Ah, no, that's good thinking. What, what did you catch yourself with? Yeah, they're not multiplication in the same way that we think of multiplication. Don't forget, all of these operations are defined in a particular way. We take for granted that multiplication is like a thing. It's, it, it's, it's what we defined it to be under our mathematical system. So with vectors, we've defined different types of multiplication. Have we defined division? This is not defined, so this is not possible. Well, what about, what if you multiply by the reciprocal? Isn't that like, well, wait a minute, what's the reciprocal of a vector? What does that even mean? Again, you could maybe define this, but it's not something that we have defined. So, not possible. And I'm just putting like a question mark, huh? Divide by a vector, what does that mean? Probably anything's possible, not in these courses, 